This is vegan 2.0. remind you to think about that, jot down a few words so that you can sort of, when you go along and read through your notes, but also when you read around your subject area, you might find other examples that you also want to take a note of. Yeah? And remembering in terms of coherence, time, space, bandwidth, so relationships with how, what wavelength do you have? What's the size of the source? Is it a point source? The bandwidth again, how many wavelengths are part of that light source? Is it just a single wavelength, as we assume in a laser? Is it multiple wavelengths? So those are the kind of things you should think about. And then we've had a look at examples. Lasers are highly coherent light sources. They have a narrow bandwidth. Ideally, they only consist of about one wavelength where spectral light sources have a few more wavelengths, so their bandwidth is a little bit wider when you compare it to a laser. Today we have a look at lasers. Now we look at the way we generate laser light, and here are a few more questions for you to reflect on as well. Now we use the word very often, we don't really think often about whether it's an acronym or not. And if we think about lasers, this is indeed an acronym. It means light amplification by st stimulated emission of radiation. It's a bit of a mouthful and quite long, so hence it's quite nice to use the abbreviation or the acronym here, which is lasers. Right, so how does it all work? This is probably a little bit revisiting some of your physics lectures <coughs> to a certain degree. If you think about you have an electron at a certain energy level, we need to raise <coughs> that energy level. So we need to add a bit of energy, then we can bring it to a higher energy state. By doing that, that's wonderful, but it's not yet creating laser light or light as such. It first happens once we have added this energy, stop adding any energy and will eventually drop down to its ground state. And when it does so, it will release a photon. So this is the process in simple terms of generating lots and lots of photons. Yeah, so we need to add something. It doesn't work without adding energy. But of course, if you add energy, it's not a very stable state, as you can imagine. Otherwise, it would be in that state already. So once we stop doing that, it'll drop to ground state again, and it'll release a photon. <coughs> now, this is spontaneous emission if we just have one photon created not enough to create a lot of laser light yet. Now, the other problem is, well, we need to have a stimulus that can add all this energy. We also need to have a material that we can add the energy and the material is still stable in this meta-stable state. And then, of course, doing that in a circle pattern, we can create light. Now, in a basic experiment, generating laser light, you have here a nice source that can survive in that metastable state, which is a ruby crystal here. You fit a high voltage tube around it with electrical supply, of course. So this is where you can add the energy. And you have two mirrors, one at the front and one at the back of the ruby crystal. One is a mir total mirror, so no light can pass out that end. The other one is a partial mirror, so we are able to release a little bit of light on one end, which we want to, if we want to generate laser light. So this is also referred to as a flash tube. 
flushing because if we continuously just provide energy, at what point would we get to the state that those electrons can drop and release the photons that would be missing? Hence, this is often referred to as a flush tube because it's flushing. So you want to intermittently add the energy. Now we can split this in almost five stages when we create laser light. So initially, we refer to the first stage as pumping. So we need to get energy in. The second stage is absorption. So the electrons can absorb that additional energy, move up to a higher energy level, and eventually release by spontaneous emission, you release your photon. Now, one photon, as I said before, isn't going to be enough. We need to have stimulated emission. And what happens in stimulated emission is, if you think about there are release by spontaneous emission of individual photons, they are trapped in this ruby crystal by the two mirrors, so they all flip back and forwards. They will bounce into other atoms, releasing further photons. So this is then referred to as stimulated emission. And the whole process, because we bump into each other, is called light amplification. And eventually, there is light released. But it's a very small amount that we release, just about 1%. So you could also sort of illustrate this by individual waves. If you say this is one photon, wave one, bumping into a few more, releasing two more photons, and then it cascades onwards and you amplify the process. Yeah, amplification just means you multiply the whole process. A cascade of photons is released. And by releasing more and more photons, think of it, one photon would be very dim loads and loads of photons would be very bright. Yeah? So a bright light source will release more photons than a dim light source. Lasers, as you will have noticed already, are usually of a particular wavelength. Yeah? Usually of one wavelength. <coughs> Therefore, we don't have white lasers. But we have red, green, couple of different other colors. Some of them are more difficult to create because you need, of course, to have a different material. And we can't just use endless materials. There are only a few that can survive in that metastable state. But one thing to remember is we create these photons and they're usually monochromatic, meaning just one wavelength. Now, here are just a few facts and again, this is something for your own reference. What is a ruby crystal made of? What wavelength does it emit? So 694.3 nanometers. Again, if you think about the visible light spectrum, 380 to 780 nanometers, anything around about the 600 mark, you're in the red sort of area, hence this has been a more red light laser. Yeah. Sadly, this initial laser didn't provide a continuous wave. It means it's intermittent. Not that you could see this, that it was intermittent, because it's very quick, but it wasn't continuous. So while you couldn't spot that with your bare eye, for certain applications where you want continuous light released, that wasn't great. Yeah. At the time when this was produced first, it has a pulse of about one millisecond in duration. Again, one millisecond and you change from bright to dark, we can't pick that up as humans. Now, the be one millimeter beam radius, everything is concentrated on that small area. And this is the reason why you read all the warnings about lasers. You shouldn't look directly into a laser light source because you've got everything concentrated on a very small area. And think about the structure of your eye. If we concentrate a lot of energy on a very small area, think about experiments with a high power plus lens 
where you use the sunlight, you can use the paper on the other side where you can create fire that way. It is pretty much like burning. There are a few things associated when we look at how do, can we relate um, energy, the frequency and the wavelength. And again, this is something for your reference, how they interplay. Yeah? So they interplay by, if we look at delta E, is that change of energy yeah, from ground state to a higher energy level. And you can see that change in energy along with Planck's constant and the frequency can also be related to the wavelength. So. They get the neutrons in these gap junctions. Each of the lens fiber cells are connected by gap junctions. So anything that's taken in through the epithelium, and epithelial cells, we have a single cell of epith a layer of epithelial cells across the cosine We'll talk about this in a later lecture. That can pass nutrients all the way in to the center of the lens um, through these gap junctions. So uh, crystalline lens health relies on the gap junction. So although these sound like um, structures that are of biological interest only, no, they have essential functions even in the eye. So where we come to really is uh, as an introduction the visual system, wherever we look at it, has cells. It has many of the structures in its cells that we'll find in every cell in the body. Um, we've seen again the biomembranes. We, we, I introduced the biomembranes as a method of... Made some strawberries, carrots with dal again, yellow lentils, and an avocado. I peel it in a special way so it keeps it looking as if it's the whole thing. But yeah, more calories. Oh. 